brought your Bibles with you tonight. There you go. Well, now some of you, okay. God bless you. We got a little work to do even here at the Institute of Catholic Culture. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, you can even write it down in your notes if you don't have time to turn there. Um, St. Paul says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me before many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay? So, so we have St. Paul. We have St. Timothy. Entrusting to faithful men who will then teach other faithful men. Four generations of bishops overseeing the church. And so I say to our, our, our non-Catholic brothers and sisters that are here tonight, God bless you. You're always welcome here at the Institute of Catholic Culture. You that are watching online, know, please, that Christ never abandoned his church from the very beginning. He passed on faithful men who would oversee our church all the way until today, and we're very blessed to have with us now two bishops tonight at the Institute of Catholic Culture, uh, Bishop Vasha last Sunday. Again, faithful men who will appoint others to take their place, always overseeing the church because Christ promised that he would never leave us, that he would always remain with us. And as St. Ignatius says, where the bishop is, there let the faithful gather just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And no, that wasn't in the, in the 17th or 18th century. That was in the 2nd century, a disciple of St. John, the evangelist himself. The Catholic Church is, is brought together around Jesus Christ, and we who are faithful members of that church are brought together around our bishops um, our speaker this evening was born in August 15, 1944 in Patterson, New Jersey after completing a BA at St. Anselm's College in Manchester, New Hampshire, New Hampshire and a BD from St. John's Seminary in Brighton, Massachusetts. Bishop Nicholas Samra was ordained a priest for the Diocese of Newton, Massachusetts on May 10, 1970. In 1989, he was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of the Diocese of Newton and in 2011, the Synod of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church elected him as Eparch of Newton to succeed Archbishop Cyril Boustros. He's an active speaker and author. Bishop Samra has written extensively on subjects of ecumenism, Christian leadership, and stewardship. And I will say that his writings have very much, very much influenced my own thoughts and preparation to follow Jesus Christ. And so I am proud to welcome back to the Institute of Catholic Culture, Bishop Nicholas Samra. Okay. Thank you so much. Can you the, that microphone? No, you're good. You're right on there. This one they can hear? Oh, yeah. okay. okay. <laughs> good evening. How are you? Good evening. I just came from Baltimore where we had the Bishops' Conference since Monday. Uh, actually, Monday the conference began. We ended today with a um, prayer service and holy hour. It was a very light meeting this year. Not too many very big, big issues were discussed. Anyway, tonight we're talking about Mary the New Eve. Mary the New Eve. In preparation for the celebration, of course, of the birth of Christ and also coming up within within the week is also the feast of her entrance into the temple. So many of the feast days of Mary come from the very early days of Christianity, which I'll be touching upon tonight. I begin. We stand very, very proud to bear the name Christian, for Christ is the center of our life. He is our way, our truth, and our life, as he himself tells us in the Gospels. He is God. True God, from true God, as we read in the creed developed by the fathers of the church. And yet he is man, so much like us. The name Christian was given to the church community at Antioch as soon as the early apostles began preaching there. And the gospel was coming to these people bringing these people into the body of Christ, which is the church. All those who accepted Jesus as their Savior were then be nicknamed Christian. 
The word Christian was a new word at that time. It was based on the Hebrew Aramaic. It was a translation of that into Greek from the Aramaic word Meshiha, meaning the anointed one. And since Greek was the spoken language of the Roman Empire, they translated as Christos and has come down to us today in the shortened form of the Greek Christ. When speaking of the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who became man for our salvation, we call him Jesus the Christ, or simply Jesus Christ. We have never opted throughout history to refer to him or to address him as anointed savior. That's one of his titles, but that's the translation of Jesus Christ, savior, the anointed one. We understand the meaning of his name, yet we have preserved his title as a name. It's a confession of faith that he is our Lord and Savior. And from the very early biblical times, we have preserved that glorious title as his name. In God's plan of redemption, his divine economy, as we call it, there is a special person, a woman, one who is intimately connected and involved in our salvation. She is Mary, a young girl of Nazareth who said yes when asked if she would accept to cooperate in God's plan of salvation. She was engaged or betrothed to Joseph a simple carpenter also from Nazareth. And by her yes to the Archangel Gabriel, she received the Godhead in her womb by the power of the Holy Spirit. God whom nothing could contain was now contained in Mary's virginal womb. Mary offered her whole being her whole human personality, her body, her soul, her spirit, allowing God to inhabit her flesh and her blood so that God could now become in an immediate physical way with his creation, becoming part of us as a human being. What a phenomenal plan God had. The love among the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit needed to generate life in order to share this love. Love is meant to be shared. To share it, the Trinity, God said, let it be. And the universe and everything within it came into being. God created the sun and the moon and the stars. And God created the comets and the planets, our earth being one. And God created the mountains and the oceans and the trees and the flowers, the sea animals and the animals walking on the earth. And then God capped off all that he made with a man and a woman and gave them reason and free will. Humanity, this man and woman, sinned and somewhat rejected God. God asked them not to touch one tree. They did. They sinned. And sin brought about evil and its consequences, death. But how could God, who generated life and love, now turn forever against those that he created in love? His awesome and phenomenal plan unfolded by the Son of God, one of the Holy Trinity, becoming incarnate, taking flesh, the flesh of a human being, and taking on all that was human. God becomes one of his creation, like us in everything but sin. The story of a holy Hindu man helps us, in a sense, understand 
the reason for the incarnation, beside, of course, our own scripture. This religious man had studied Christianity and was considering becoming a Christian himself. He could accept practically everything that Christianity taught and professed. However, there was one stumbling block for him, the incarnation. He figured, why, why would God, the creator, the maker of all of this universe, so glorious in heavens and revered by all, why would this God become a human being? Why would he condescend to become human? He was contemplating this mystery while walking on the great plains in India where there are very large anthills. We have them in our country by the cracks of the sidewalk. But in India, the plains have these larger ones. As the day was spent, the shadows of the setting sun began to be cast and his shadow now covered the ants that were outside of their anthill. They recognized the shadow as a danger. And they began scurrying back to get back inside the anthill because they were afraid. They were afraid. He looked at them. He recognized they were running away from him. He saw this. And he said to himself, I know. I know the ants are afraid of me. But I love all of God's creatures. I respect everything that God made. The tiniest ant I would not kill. He said, I wish, I wish I can become an ant right now and speak ant language to them and tell them, I love you and I will not hurt you. And then the light bulb went off in his head. Ah, that's, that's why now he knew. That's why God became a human being. To enter into our humanity, say, I love you. I'm part of you. No longer away from you, but now intimately connected. In order to effect this incarnation then, God's plan involved a human mother. Mary, the ever-virgin, is that very one. So our understanding of Mary flows from our understanding of Christ. Mary gave him flesh. She nourished him within her body for nine months and gave birth to him. She fed him with her milk. She taught him how to be human. She is, the, she is his mother. She is mother of Jesus Christ. She is mother of God. The divine motherhood of Mary was celebrated in the church from the earliest days of Christianity. As the church began to understand that in the incarnation, God took flesh, it realized that God became a real man to identify with his creation, to save it, and to divinize or make it holy and return to God and godliness all that humanity had and everything in the universe to make it holy. So let us take a step back now in time. A step back into the Old Testament. Mary, mother of God, is seen in the Old Testament in signs or what we sometimes call types. In other words, we look at the Old Testament with eyes or glasses of the New Testament. We see Mary in images. Certainly, the authors of the Old Testament books did not have Mary in mind when they wrote. However, we Christians look at the Old Testament with the eyes of faith, and with the eyes of the New Covenant, or the New Testament, and we see the Mother of God in imagery. We look deeper into the spiritual meaning in certain texts of the Old Testament. Mary is the new Eve. The first woman, Eve, disobeyed God's command with Adam, and sin entered the world. 
Mary's obedience to God's will brings salvation from the fall. Mary is the new Eve who gives birth to the new Adam, Jesus. Eve comes from the rib of Adam, just as Christ, the new Adam, comes from the body of Mary, the new Eve. You see the connections in this imagery. When Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran, he stopped for the night at a shrine and he slept. We read in Genesis, Then he had a dream, a stairway, or a ladder, rested on the ground, with its top reaching to the heavens. When he awoke from sleep, he exclaimed, Truly, this is nothing else but an abode of God, and that is the gateway to heaven. The ladder connecting earth to heaven is a type or an image of Mary who bore Christ, thus uniting earth and heaven. Mary is seen symbolically in the Old Testament as the Ark of the Covenant. Psalm 131 or 132, whatever number system you use. Advance, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the Ark of your Majesty. We see her in that. We see her in the burning yet unconsumed bush that Moses saw on fire and yet was not consumed. How do we see her there? She bore the divinity and yet was untouched, preserving her virginity. The three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace of the Chaldeans that we read in Daniel were untouched by the fire, and Mary was untouched in her virginity, even with the fire of the divinity. The dew, the dew on the fleece of Gideon in the book of Judges in the Old Testament is a type also of Mary. We read, the fleece was dry, but there was dew on the ground. Mary was preserved from sin. In this imagery. In Ezekiel, we read, The gate is to remain closed, the gate of Jerusalem. It is not open for anyone to enter it, since the Lord God of Israel has entered it. It shall remain closed. This is another vivid allusion to Mary's virginal womb. Mary is seen also as the unhewn stone from a mountain, without a hand being put to it. It became a great mountain, and it filled the whole earth, again from the book of Daniel. Mary is the pledge of restoration, as seen in the prophet Jeremiah. The lampstand of Zechariah is a type of Mary, as well as the staff of Aaron in the book of Numbers. Of course, we have the great text, which you probably all know very well, of Isaiah the prophet. The Lord himself will give you this sign. The virgin shall be with child and shall name him Emmanuel, God with us. There are other types to be found in the Old Testament, which I encourage you to find on your own without me telling you all about them. So when you go home, pick it up. And read through it a little bit. You can get a concordance and look up Mary and you'll find some more imagery. Let's move on to the New Testament. The New Testament speaks very little about Mary. It was the proclamation of Jesus Christ that they were trying to get across. However, she is seen as the greatest woman who ever lived. The Archangel Gabriel addresses her. At the Annunciation, rejoice, O favored, highly favored daughter. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. From the Gospel of Luke. 
Continuing, Mary says yes, and her acceptance, she herself proclaims, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me as you say. She then picks up and she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth cries out, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And Mary, even in Luke's gospel, herself proclaims in her own words, All generations shall call me blessed. Both Matthew and Luke mention the event of Mary's giving birth to Christ. Mark has no mention in his gospel. John records Mary at the wedding feast of Cana in Galilee, where she intercedes with her son to help with the wine shortage. We see her at the foot of the cross when the dying Jesus entrusts her to John, woman, there is your son. And to John he says, there is your mother. In the Acts of the Apostles, we learn that, quote, there were some women in their disciples' company, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. We move on from the New Testament now to the generation right after, and we look back now into these fathers of the church and the early church councils. Great theological debates were taking place in the very early centuries. And the truths of the Christian faith needed defining. Among the truths and issues of Trinity in one God and the incarnation of God in the flesh, there also arose the understanding and the role of Mary. She was not a substitute for Jesus, who is our only Savior. Yet her closeness to him and her personal holiness made the incarnation possible. By the second century, we have the witness that Mary was called, a Greek word, Theotokos. This title became more prominent in the third and particularly the fourth century, which was dominated by Trinitarian controversies. Christological problems abounded and needed explanation. So let us take a look at the meaning of Theotokos. Since Greek was the language of the Roman Empire at that time, the Greek word Theotokos was immediately applied to Mary. It's a formation of two words. Theos means God in Greek. And tokos comes from a word meaning a woman who carried a child in her womb and bore it. It's a sentence, but that's what it means. A woman who carried a child and bore it. So thus Mary is the one who gave birth or bore God in the human flesh. In common English, we have generally translated Theotokos as mother of God. However, a mother could also mean an adopted mother. A child who is adopted certainly calls his parents mother and father. So there is a fine distinction, though, in the Greek that makes Mary more than just any mother, but the one who gave birth in a physical manner. Some translations of Theotokos use the words bearer of God or God-bearer. This is fine, only if we are to understand bearer as the one who bore a child. Yet in Greek, many saints are called God-bearer, Theophorus. This is certainly in a spiritual or moral and virtuous sense. Yet Mary goes beyond being a bearer in the virtuous sense only. She is a God-bearer, not spiritually or morally, 
but in a real physical way. She is not Theophorus. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> like any saint. She is Theotokos, the one who gave birth to God. All of us carry the image of God. And we each can be called Theophorus, God bearers. But the greatest and the most sublime reality is Mary's. She is elevated to the physical touch of the divinity. She lives a miracle more miraculous than all miracles. To her we apply these words in the Byzantine liturgy, more honorable than the cherubim, more and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim. We call her sinless, all holy, pure and immaculate, Yet these words are minor when we see and know her to be Theotokos, the birth giver of God. This expression or title of Mary was first applied to her from around the year 250 AD in Egypt. We do not have to go through all the fathers of the church who speak of her with this title, for there are many. But her title, Theotokos, was used by Alexander of Alexandria, Athanasius, Nonus, Cyril of Alexandria, and Gregory Nazianzus, long before the Council of Ephesus. Gregory of Nazianzus says, if anyone does not believe that Mary is Theotokos, meaning the birth giver, he is severed from the Godhead. Gregory of Nyssa, as well as Eustathius of Antioch, used the title long before Ephesus. This is interesting since the problems around its use really developed more at Antioch. I just mentioned the Council of Ephesus. What's that all about? I noted previously that the 4th century particularly was filled with Trinitarian and Christological controversies. In Antioch, there was always more stress on the human nature of Christ. Whereas in Alexandria and Egypt, the stress was on the unity of the divine and the human. Nestorius, a priest at Antioch, well known for his eloquence, in the year 428 was elected Archbishop of Constantinople. He saw the word Theotokos as a confusion between the divinity and the humanity of Jesus. And he preached strongly, Let no man call Mary Theotokos, for Mary was only a human being, and it is impossible that God should be born of a human being. In modern contemporary English, we can say, all hell broke loose. <laughs> A battle began. Words and ideas were hurled around, flying in confusion. Some were calling Mary Anthropotokos, <laughs> the birth giver of a man. Some were calling her Christotokos, the birth giver of Christ. So the Council of Ephesus was convoked then not to propose a doctrine or a dogma about Mary, as some think, but rather to define that the human nature of Christ, which was taken from her, was complete and real, and that this nature was united substantially and completely with the divine person of the Son of God. So thus Christ is one person, with two natures. He is fully human. He is fully divine. Because Mary was the actual mother of God, the one who bore him in her womb, his birth giver, and consequently is Theotokos. John of Damascus, a great saint from the East, explains this further. The word, Jesus, did not take his divinity from Mary, 
But the Word, Jesus, who had been with the Father from eternity, took flesh from her when the time of the Incarnation had come. So the primary purpose of the Council of Ephesus was to refute a heresy called Nestorianism. Nestorius held to that moral or spiritual union and not a physical one. He said that Mary was simply the mother of Jesus, not the mother of God made man. In 431, the council met and made the final decision that Christ was of two natures, true God, true man, united in one and unique divine person of Jesus Christ. The beautiful final declaration of Ephesus reads like a song of triumph. Let me read it to you. We confess and proclaim that our Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father, is real God and real man. He is composed of soul, reason, and of body. In regard to his humanity, he was born of the Virgin Mary. For us and for our salvation he was born. He is of one essence with the Father according to his divinity, consubstantial with us according to our humanity. The union of divinity and humanity was a real unity in him. Therefore, we recognize, but only one Christ, one only Son, one only Lord. Because of this union, without any confusion, we confess that the Holy Virgin is Theotokos. God the Word was made flesh. He became man. And he emptied himself since his conception, the temple, our human nature, which he assumed from her. Mary is his mother, his birth giver. Therefore, she is Theotokos. The tradition of the church very early in the Christian centuries celebrated the important events in the life of Mary. Some of her feasts come from apocryphal writings of tradition. Her conception in the womb of Anne on December 9th. Her birth to Joachim and Anne on September 8th. Her entrance into the temple on November 21. And her dormition and assumption on August 15th. An interesting note is that the time of her birth is off by one day. Not a perfect nine months from the date of her conception. Her conception was celebrated in the East long before the declaration of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception in the West, which placed it on December 8th. Her feast day of birth was September 8th, but her conception was December 9th, one day off, just to show that there was a specialness even there. Today, the traditional birthplace of Mary stands in the old city of Jerusalem, near the gate called Sitna Maryam, or Our Lady Mary. It's a very beautiful basilica named St. Anne, and it's next to the sheep's pool, Bethesda, where the sick man was cured after 38 years of trying to get into the healing waters. Her tomb is just outside of this gate in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Annunciation on March 25th is the only event besides the birth of Christ in the life of Mary mentioned in sacred scripture in the Bible. A very Eastern custom developed to honor the mother of a child on the day after its birth. So the Eastern Church has celebrated her maternity or giving birth on December 26th. The 25th, we remember Jesus for being born. The 26th, we congratulate Mary for giving birth to him. Numerous other feasts related to miracles 
or icons of the Virgin were added to the calendar over the years. Mary is very predominant in the iconography of the church, particularly the East, yet she, was, she is always seen with Jesus, her son, who gives her her importance. Many names were given to these icons, either by style or by the cities where they were located. She is called, a Greek word, Odigitria, means the guide. In this icon, she carries Christ in her arms and is pointing to him, directing us to focus on him, pointing to him as the guide who leads the way. The famous Vladimir icon from Russia is called Eleusa, or the Virgin of Tenderness. There we see Jesus hanging around her neck, hugging his mother. In some icons, we see that she is nursing Christ from her breast. The icon that became very popular in the West is called Our Lady of Perpetual Help, originally from Constantinople. And it depicts Jesus on the arm of Mary. And he is frightened by the angels carrying instruments of his passion. And the tradition said he jumped up into the arms of his mother. And that's why you see his sandal hanging off his foot. As he jumped up, the sandal hung. Mary is predominant also in church architecture. Particularly the East. Iconography and church architecture blend in such a way as to attempt to create heaven on earth. And Mary is seen in a special way in church architecture. In the Byzantine divine liturgy of St. Basil the Great, a fourth century father of the church, we sing a special hymn to the mother of God within the anaphora or the offering of the liturgy. And it says, In you, O full of grace, all creation rejoices, the orders of angels and the human race as well. O sanctified temple, spiritual paradise, glory of virgins, from whom our God, who exists before all eternity, took flesh and became a little child. He has taken your womb as his throne, making it more spacious than the heavens. Therefore, O full of grace, in you all creation rejoices. Glory to you. This beautiful hymn is generally portrayed simply by the icon of what we call platitera, another Greek word, more spacious or wider than the heavens. Nothing could contain God. God cannot be contained, yet Mary's body contained him. It is represented in a properly uh, appointed church, Byzantine church, high in the apse over the holy place where the altar is, the sanctuary. It may be an icon of Mary enthroned, holding, holding Christ, or more traditional, what we call Our Lady of the Sign, Mary in a orans or praying position with her ends outstretched in prayer, and Jesus Christ in her womb. She is surrounded by angels in art. And her icons are also in the nave of the church because she's from the human race as well. What is the connection of the icon and architecture? A dome is the sign of heaven over the body of the church. It sits over the nave where the people gather. It is painted in the Byzantine tradition with the Almighty in there. We call it Pantocrator, the Almighty One. The image of Jesus Christ looking down on his church, his body. It may also include the heavenly liturgy up there, sometimes angels and prophets on different levels. But the breakthrough of God to humanity came through Mary. And the apse soars very, very high and almost touches the base of the dome. And there is Mary, the one who united heaven to the earth by giving birth to Christ. So she is painted there or mosaic there 
not just because of our devotion to her, but rather because she becomes the symbol or the image of the entire church. As she gave flesh to Christ, we are called also to give flesh to him when we leave the church building by living his word, the gospel, and by being his Eucharistic body. In Byzantine and other Eastern churches, Mary is never portrayed without Christ. Her importance comes through him. Eastern piety on Mary is also very liturgical. We have poetic hymns that were written for all of her feast days and are chanted in the various hours of the liturgical worship, vespers, matins, or orthros, the different hours of the day, the evening prayer, whatever it may be. Her name and role pervade all the liturgies. Even the divine liturgy of the Eucharist, she is mentioned numerous times. We have a hymn called the Irmos from the Ode. It's a, a group of uh, hymns or songs in the morning prayer. And we take one of them and put it into the divine liturgy, into the Eucharist. When her name is mentioned in the commemorations, we sing a hymn in honor of her, which started around the 11th century. And in these words, we call her ever virgin, pure and immaculate, without sin, full of grace. The most famous hymn honoring the mother of God is what we call the Akatistos or Akathist hymn composed by a, a Saint Romanus, a great singer in the year 532. He was a deacon. And he composed this very long, what we call Kondakian, of 24 different stanzas. And some of, the, some of the historical study people think today that they were sung homilies, where he would get up and chant them. And they even sometimes maybe even acted them out, much like the medieval plays in Europe, so that there was some action even there. This long Akathist hymn is based on scripture and the tradition, and it relates the incarnation of Christ. It's called Akathist, which means standing. You can't sit down, okay? It means standing, because it was chanted at the liberation of Constantinople in the year 626. The faithful and the clergy remained standing in the church all night while their city was being under siege by outsiders, begging for her intercession. In the Greek and Melkite churches, this hymn is sung on the first five Friday evenings of Great Lent, because it was on that fifth Saturday that Constantinople was saved. So we honor that by singing it in parts along the way. It's most likely dedicated and direct to the Feast of the Annunciation, which most times, almost all the time, falls during Great Lent, one of the great feasts of our church that is only celebrated one day because you can't make it several days because you have Great Lent that changes things. At a later date, another canon of hymns was composed called the Paraclesis, translated as a canon of consolation, asking Mary to be our intercessor. It's chanted every day in the Byzantine church from August 1 to August 14th, the fasting season prior to the feast of Mary's dormition or falling asleep. It is also used any time when consolation is requested. At matins or morning prayer of Marian feast days, we read a gospel pericope from Luke recounting the visit of Mary to Elizabeth when Elizabeth honors her and Mary also says, all generations will call me blessed. At the divine liturgy on Mary and feast days, we read the Martha and Mary story, emphasizing that contemplating Jesus is the important matter not getting up and worrying about cooking or cleaning, contemplating Jesus. To this text, it's very interesting, are added two other verses in our gospel pericope that are very important in understanding the role of Mary. While teaching his disciples, 
we read in Luke's gospel, a woman from the crowd cried out, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. Jesus says, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And this is the image also for us. Mary heard the word of God and kept it and lived it and is the image for us to do the same. This is not demeaning his mother when he says this in the scripture. A very interesting remark I think is necessary here. In a few gospel passages, we hear about the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. From early Christian days, James, the first bishop of Jerusalem, is, was always called brother of the Lord. Look on your calendars and his feast day. You'll see James, brother of the Lord. In Matthew and Mark's gospels, we read, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, a brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? In Mark's gospel, we read, his mother and his brothers arrived. His mother and brothers. And as they stood outside, they sent word to him to come out. The crowd seated around him said, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. Jesus says in reply, Who are my mother and my brothers? These are my mothers. These are my mother and brothers. Whoever does the will of God is brother and sister and mother to me. Well, who are these brothers and sisters? We know Mary was a virgin. She only had Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit and not by Joseph. The Western tradition ascribes these brothers and sisters as cousins or relatives of Jesus. The Semitic languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, we do not have one single word for cousin, like we have in English. For cousin, we have to say in these Aramaic languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic, we have to say the son or daughter of my father's brother or sister, or in the son and daughter of my mother's brother or sister. So you have several words to say cousin. Thus making them cousins to Jesus in the Western tradition. More so, it was even very common in those days, and even today among Semitic people, to look and speak to, brother, to, uh, to cousins as your brothers and sisters. It's one family. One family. However, the Eastern tradition, based on the apocryphal Gospels, the tradition of the church, state that Joseph the husband of Mary was previously married and his wife died, leaving him with some children. Now some will say, oh, Joseph is called Chase. Yes, Chase after he married Mary. But he had the possibility of previous marriage and children. And his wife dies. Now he takes Mary to be his wife. These children then would be considered the stepbrothers or stepsisters of Jesus. Not half, step. Okay? Very easy understanding. Much easier than trying to figure out how they're cousins. And that's a very strong Eastern tradition. The earliest teachings of the church state that Jesus is the only son of Mary. Another feast, the Dormition, or falling asleep of Mary, Mother of God, is a very curious event, again based on the early tradition of the church, not the scripture. From scripture we know nothing of the circumstances surrounding her death. Various stories developed in tradition and embellished with childlike love and tenderness, but we are under no compulsion to defend the historicity of any of them. Her death is beautifully explained in the icon of the Dormition. Mary dies as a human being and lies on her deathbed. The apostles were miraculously gathered to pay homage to the Mother of God. 
With them we see Paul and some other bishops mourning and other women mourning and crying. We see Christ standing in a almond-shaped mandorla of radiant light. In his arm carrying a little Mary wrapped in swaddling clothes. A sign that she is alive and eternally with him. The West calls the feast Assumption. She returned to God, body and soul. In this icon, we see not total sorrow, but joy. And most profoundly, not death, but life. In the Dormition feast, the church remembers the love of Jesus for his mother. The details may not be historically factual completely in context. Rather, the church looks instead at the essence and meaning of her death the death of the one whose son in the flesh conquered death, was raised and promised resurrection and victory of an undying life. That's also our promise. The Byzantine troparian and Kandakian of this feast from the fourth century tell you have preserved your virginity and in falling asleep you did not forsake the world, O mother of God. You have passed to life, being the mother of life. Through your intercessions, save our souls from death. The other prayer says, Neither death nor the tomb could hold the mother of God. She is always ready to intercede for us, forever our steady hope and protection. She is the mother of life, Christ, who dwelt in her ever-virginal womb, lifted her up to life. The story relates that eight days later, a few days later, we don't know exactly, Thomas got there late, she was dead and buried. He wants to see her, they take him to the tomb, they open it, no body, flowers only, Mary's assumption. Mary was the first one then to be called back into the heavenly life. She is not a substitute for Christ, for he is the only Savior. Yet her yes and her personal holiness and her flesh made the incarnation possible. So we see her first among the saints. This was the first celebration of death remembered and commemorated after the death of Christ. Later the death of martyrs was celebrated as feast days of their eternal life when they went back to heaven. But Mary's death was the first. In the beautiful Akathis hymn that I mentioned, we hear words, Rejoice, bright dawn of the mystical day. Contemplating Christ's death as well as Mary's death, we understand that death is no more. A person's very act of dying has now become an act of living. The entrance into life, where life reigns. She who gave herself completely to Christ, who loved him to the end, is met by him as these radiant gates of death take her in. At this meeting, death is turned into a joyful encounter. Life is triumphant. Since Mary's life was an encounter with God filled with love, her death was a continuous movement toward the light of eternity. Then, The horror of death, grief and separation, descent into loneliness and darkness is not present. Perfect love casts out fear, as we read in John's epistle. For Mary, death becomes triumphant life. We too will die, and it will be joyful. Death is no longer death, but an entrance to life. Death radiates with eternity and immortality. Death is not a rupture, but a union. It is not sorrow, but joy. Not defeat, but victory. So when contemplating the Dormition icon, we celebrate ourselves too. As we anticipate, taste, and delight, even now, in the dawn of the mystical day, the never-fading day. When we enter the church, I mentioned the first thing we see when we look at the holy place, this majestic plotty terror wider than the heavens up in the holy, above the holy altar. Mary giving flesh to Christ. 
reminding us that we must give flesh to him too. When we turn around to exit the church, the last icon we should see, if it's properly appointed, the church that is, is the in the nave, the dormition or the falling asleep of Mary, reminding us that we too will die, yet called to joy and victory in death. So Mary becomes the perfect image of human dignity. She is the new Eve. She kept her likeness to God untarnished. She is the image of our call to divinization, a life of theosis or deified life. Let me move once again now to the present. As Eastern Christians, or as any Christians, we celebrate our faith in doctrine, in scripture, in liturgy, and the full tradition of the church. Our liturgy is ancient, yet so alive and real today. We know we are human, called once again to be godly. Our earthly life is a procession to God, a procession in which we attempt to relive our godliness lost through sin. We are called to become divine, certainly not God, but sharers in the God life. The God life is love, and love is always exemplified by a mother. For Mary, our liturgical languages have always used mother of God. The Greek is mitter theou, and we use theotokos, birth giver. In Greek, there was more definition with these two words. Even when Old Slavonic was created from Greek, they created a word. They had the word mother of God, but they also created a word in Slavonic, bogodritsa, meaning the birth giver. This was a created word to fulfill the profession of faith. Mary was not just any mother, but the actual birth giver of God. In other languages, we have distinction. For instance, in Arabic, we have Um Allah, meaning mother of God, and we have Walidat Allah, meaning the birth giver of God. In Latin, we have Mater Dei, mother of God, and Dei Genetrix, birth giver of God. Sadly, English lacks so much definition. Birth giver is not a proper English word, but rather a newly formed word and still not fully accepted or used in proper English. I, haven't looked, I looked in many dictionaries and it doesn't exist. So we, we either need to create it or figure out something else. In regards to Mary, there has been a return to these proper theological truths especially since she is the one who gave birth to God. This is happening east and west. Several years ago at the bishops' conference, there was a, doctrine, uh, a document written by the bishops, and they used the word theotokos, found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, by the way. I intervened because they put a note, the writers proposed as a footnote, theotokos means God-bearer, for an explanation. So I made an intervention and I explained to them the delicacy of the word Theotokos, birth giver, and Theophorus, God bearer. As I previously mentioned this evening, a saint, a Christian, or any one of you can be Theophorus, a God bearer. But only Mary could be Theotokos, his birth giver. My amendment was accepted. Look at our liturgy. Many people prefer particular languages for responses like Kyrie eleison, Hos budi pomiloi in Slavonic, Ya Raburham in Arabic, for Lord have mercy. In fact, the Latin liturgy of the Roman Church until Vatican II maintained Kyrie eleison, never translated it into its Latin form, which was never used in the Latin liturgy. Kyrie eleison was Greek. Indeed, so many Latin church faithful who were not too favorable to post-Vatican II liturgical reforms started to complain and cry out, at least let us keep Kyrie eleison to preserve the Latin. And it wasn't Latin, it was Greek. <laughs> it was Greek. So from time immemorial, we have maintained in our liturgies and church language some Aramaic and Hebrew words in the liturgy. And they're still in use to today. 
we sing amen or amen, whatever sound you like, a word which is so difficult to translate. It means strong yes, or so be it, or I agree, or commonly right on, <laughs> or for sure, and many other concoctions. Yes, we still use amen. For a long time, the French were translating it liturgically as en suisse, you know, ainsi soit-il. But now they even went back to using the word amen or amin. All of the languages, it's common. Greek, Latin, English, Slavonic, French, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, and on and on. Hosanna. An anglicized form of Hosanna. It means, oh save us. And was sung by the Hebrew people as a welcome to Christ as he entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey. It has remained fixed and untranslated in most traditions. Sabaoth is really difficult to translate. Lord of Sabaoth. Hosts, powers, angel forces, armies, probably all of them together. Can you use eight words to translate it? No. So most churches prefer to keep Lord of Sabaoth. We understand it better. We welcome the gospel. How do you welcome the gospel? With a joyful Alleluia. Not English. Translate it. Hallelujah becomes praise or give praise to God. Yet yeah, Alleluia or Hallelujah shout loudly praise to God and they have remained in our liturgy. It has remained. Pascha, the Greek form of the Aramaic and Hebrew Pisach, meaning the Passover, is a much better word for the Lord's resurrection than our modern English Easter, which is a corruption of the name of a pagan goddess of spring. Estra. Pascha. Much better. The use of similar words is very abundant in church. You'll find some more. So it's time now for us to recapture something. Theotokos. It's time for us to make it an acceptable English word. If we're proud of our faith, if we profess what we believe, if we love our spiritual patrimony, then we must confess Mary to be the true mother of God, his true birth giver. We must make a, com a profession of faith as we speak to her. It's a profession of faith in the royal dignity and divine worth of our own humanity. Indeed, from our humanity, God chose a girl and drew her so close to his divinity as to make her his own mother on earth. He made her Theotokos. John of Damascus says, the name Theotokos contains the whole history of the divine plan of salvation in the world and the whole mystery of the Incarnation. So I greet you and remind you, profess and confess your faith in Jesus Christ and recognize and say, Mary, his Holy Mother, the new Eve is Theotokos. Thank you very much. Uh, you had said one of the ideas about uh, the brothers of Christ was that Joseph had sons from his previous marriage. Um, unless they had all died by the crucifixion, why would he have put Mary in John's care? Joseph was deceased. Right. Joseph was deceased, of right. course. More but than likely, Joseph was deceased already. Right, but if he had... If she had other children, stepchildren, stepchildren, why would Jesus not have put we her don't in know. their care? And we, again, the gospel was written not to give us all the details. All the details. It's just the historical, uh, you know, tradition out there. We don't know why he did that. I mean, he, John, John stayed with them to the cross. The only one of the twelve men that went to the cross. The other ones ran away. So he. John was the youngest, so he said, you know, take care of his mother. You know, that's probably the, you know, the, the actual answer that we can give. 
As we really don't know for sure all the other, all of the other, just traditions. Just a reminder to those writing in online: don't write me a book, write me a question. <laughs> one of the okay. one of the comments that somebody yes. had asked me when they came up here about this untying the knot. Okay, untying the knot. Uh, Pope Francis, right after he was elected, spoke about Mary as untying the knot. This isn't, he didn't mean that we go to her to ask her to untie our knots of sin and all. This untying the knot was, she untied the knot that was dividing us from God through the sin of Adam and Eve. And Mary untied it through her participation with God in saying yes to become his mother. So the knot so to say, the fallen nature was now once again pulled back together. Um, thank you, Your Grace. Um, one title that you hear a lot of Catholics grant Mary, but I don't believe has ever been officially proclaimed, is co-redemptrix. This is a title that seems to give our separated brethren in the Protestant churches particular heartburn. Is this title uh, defensible? It, it also gives Catholics heartburn, too, because she cannot be co-redemptrix. We had one Redeemer, and that is Jesus Christ. She participated with him. She participated with him, but she was not co-redeemer. So that's why this doctrine has always been pushed to the side. I mean, so many people are trying to get it. It will never be declared. It can't be, because there's one Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Um, Sayedna, frequently Protestants, uh, evangelicals, non-denominationals have a problem with the role of the Theotokos in salvation history as you explained it to us. Why is that and what's a good way to communicate that role to them? I think they, they don't understand it because so many of the Protestants just take scripture only. They don't take the living tradition of the church. And in the scripture, Mary is very little mentioned, like I said. Because it wasn't telling the life of Mary, it was telling Christ. We're trying to proclaim Christ. And that's what the apostles did. So the living tradition of the church that existed from the early centuries had this. And they just reject some of that as not, you know, only because it doesn't say it in the Bible. And you find some very evangelical Christians like that among the Protestants. The Bible is the only word of God. Well, there's other things. That, that's the actual word of God, of course, but tradition is living from the early church too. comes down to us. So uh, it, I think just from the fact that Mary says, all generations shall call me blessed. If they, if they can't see that, that's very clear. That, that's in Scripture. That's in Scripture. And the role of the mother. Thank you very much, Bishop Nicholas. Thank you.